The Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex is an incredible experience if you're visiting Central Florida. Existing as a massive museum-like campus that brings you up close to the American Space Program. It captures both the past, allowing you to step up closely to the unfathomably large rockets of some of NASA's most important missions, optimistically contrasting that with the bright future of where the space frontier will guide civilization. The scale of many of these remnants found throughout often have a surreal quality to them that transcends the ubiquity of everyday life, giving you true perspective into the challenges of space travel and how far it has come. Located on the Atlantic coast of Florida, NASA's complex is an attraction worth driving out of your way for if you're visiting Orlando's theme parks, and is a must-do if you're visiting Florida's east coast beaches. This attraction isn't just a learning experience, acting as a museum for NASA's history of space exploration, but is itself truly one of the most intriguing and unique themed experiences out there. So come join me today as we take a look at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, as they provide you with an overview of one of the most interesting museums you can find anywhere in the world. When first walking up to the entrance, one of the first elements you'll spot is the iconic NASA logo, also known comedically as the NASA Meatball. Normally, a memorial to John F. Kennedy is viewable right behind it, but it does appear to currently be under refurbishment. However, once you go through security and admissions, the first thing that most visitors will notice is the impressive rocket garden. With the exception of the first rocket you encounter, the Mercury Atlas, which is a full-scale replica, all of these unused rockets were built and configured for flight before eventually retiring here. It's a bit difficult to understand their scale on video, but they're massive in person, especially the Saturn 1B that is laying on its side towards the back. Throughout the day, guys will appear to give presentations in the rocket garden, describing the different rocket series and how they were used for their respective missions. To start off your journey into learning about space exploration, the first building you may choose to enter contains an exhibit titled Heroes and Legends, which also features the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. On first walking into the building, visitors will watch a film projected onto a domed screen, which introduces them to the earliest astronauts of NASA. When the theater lets out, you can witness another decommissioned rocket that never saw flight, the MR6, which was part of the same rocket series that launched the first American into space, Ellen Shepard. In this museum-like area, nine different capsules are themed around what are described as heroic characteristics belonging to the astronauts of NASA. Each capsule exists as a small exhibit, displaying artifacts or personal belongings associated with different early astronauts. Other notable features include a recreation of the control center for the Project Mercury series of rockets, relocating the actual consoles used to this site. Another notable artifact is the scorched capsule from the Gemini 9A flight, also allowing you to see inside. Moving further through the building, visitors will step into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame, first encountering a golden statue of Alan Shepard himself. Along the walls, you can also find displays of different astronauts, displaying the different missions they flew on in the year that they were inducted into the hall. Admittedly, I didn't really feel like it got the full impact of the pavilion because I went in using a side entrance to find the bathroom and missed the film, but I do think it's one of the less exciting offerings of Kennedy Space Center. Seeing the redstone rocket suspended from the ceiling is pretty cool, but this exhibit is otherwise rather small compared to what you will encounter later. By the way, if you enjoyed the video thus far, or want to support the channel, you can do me a favor by just leaving a like. 
As you exit the Hall of Fame back out into the Rocket Garden, a number of buildings and experiences will be open to explore. However, bus tours are available that will bring you to another complex, the Apollo Building, located inside the actual working area of NASA, and only run until around 2.30. I would consider this to be a priority, especially since the bus queue will get backed up with groups of field trips, even though there are plenty of buses that run regularly. The bus tour begins by leaving the visitor center and bringing you past another early redstone rocket. However, once you travel through the gates and enter into the restricted area, the bus will travel south and move past the absolutely massive Vehicle Assembly Building, the purpose of which is pretty self-explanatory from the name. It's difficult to understand the scale from video or even from the bus, but the doors themselves are apparently large enough to fit the entire Statue of Liberty through, including the base. Depending on scheduled rocket launches, there is also the possibility that you may see a crawler as well, the massive tracked vehicle designed to transport rockets to the launch pad. On arriving at the Apollo building, visitors will watch a show that recreates the experience of the Apollo 8 launch, seating everyone on tiered rows inside a theater that recreates the control room, again reusing the actual consoles from the mission. In this particular show, screens up above first start to provide information about this particular mission, the first where NASA astronauts revolved around the moon. It continues and speaks about how the launch was prepared, giving you context into how many things could go wrong. Once the astronauts enter the capsule and the door is sealed, the consoles light up and a countdown begins, simulating the intense three minutes before launch, and providing visitors with insight into how much work goes into it. Finally, on ignition, the simulated sky behind the control room turns bright orange, as if a rocket is really launching from the launch pad outside and a show effect results in the windows and theater shaking as this occurs. Triumphantly, the rocket successfully launches and one of the actual astronauts, Jim Lavelle, appears on screen to conclude the show, describing the significance of the mission. While I don't believe that I've actually described the show in a particularly interesting way, I can say that's definitely one of the highlights of Kennedy Space Center, allowing you to get a real glimpse into how dramatic and stressful an actual rocket launch can be. On exiting the theater, visitors will be stunned to enter a long hangar where they can witness one of the Saturn V rockets, which is truly impressive in scale. Throughout the hangar, numerous exhibits exist that either teach about the Saturn V series or have displays that recreate equipment used in the lunar missions, including lunar rovers, and a scene that uses the unused Lunar Module 9 to recreate a moonscape of Apollo 11. Tucked towards the back, an exhibit highlights the unfortunate fate of the astronauts of Apollo 1, who perished in a cabin fire during a launch rehearsal in 1967. The exhibit honors the three astronauts who lost their lives, Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, detailing how the hatch was redesigned for subsequent Apollo missions to ensure a quick escape if needed. If you step outside of the complex, there are two areas where visitors can wander. First, an area with bleachers is set up here, miles from the launch pad, which is intended to be used when watching rocket launches. A second area that is accessible to visitors is the Moon Tree Garden, paying tribute to all the Apollo missions and displaying trees that are descendants of seeds brought to the moon. Also notable here is the bronze statue of the crew of Apollo 11, featuring Michael Collins, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin. Before leaving the Apollo complex, there is another show I would like to discuss, which is located in the Lunar Theater at the nose end of the Saturn V rocket. Inside the Stark Theater, visitors will be able to relive the tense moments leading up to the landing of the Lunar Module for Apollo 11, detailing the unforeseen issues that almost led to catastrophe. As the module is just about to land, it transitions from the screen and into an actual prop that descends onto the stage creating an impressive and dramatic moment that feels like it very much belongs as a significant milestone of American history. The show moves on to the first uneasy steps on the lunar surface, and a model of Neil Armstrong and the American flag rise up onto the stage. The show continues, describing that first initial experience and the experiments performed by Armstrong and Aldrin. Finally, as it's time to leave, the capsule dramatically detaches from the module as it ascends off of the moon. 
In this final segment of the show, it transitions to an admittedly dated portion, where school-aged children are interviewed and express the different ways that they want to contribute to the space program when they're older. As they do so, panels highlight at the back of the stage, revealing the Earth, the International Space Station, Mars, and distant galaxies to provide an optimistic context. Again, I don't think that this show sounds particularly interesting just from my description, but it's definitely a highlight you won't want to miss if you visit. The theater then lets out into a lunar museum with numerous artifacts from the moon missions on display. This includes a variety of suits, including the one worn by Alan Shepard on the Apollo 14 mission. Other artifacts include a variety of gear, moon rocks, and the capsule from Apollo 14 itself. There's a lot to see in the Apollo building, but once finished, visitors can find their way back out to the bus loop and travel back to the main complex. After the 15 minute bus ride back, visitors will find themselves closest to the Space Shuttle Atlantis building. This impressive display has visitors first walking through a scale recreation of the rocket boosters, and once inside the entrance, moving up a series of ramps where they view two short films. At the conclusion of the second film, the screen becomes translucent, revealing the Space Shuttle Atlantis, which is certainly impressive up close, suspended from the ceiling like the Saturn V. While really not any larger than a medium-sized airplane, the Space Shuttle Atlantis still manages to feel massive just from its presentation. There is also a surreal, otherworldly quality about it with its unique design, especially with how intimidating its propulsion engines can appear to be. The upper floor of the Atlantis building is full of other displays as well, with one of the most notable being a scale replica of the Hubble Space Telescope. Other upstairs displays include a number of educational exhibits, including a replica of the Atlantis cockpit, providing insight into how complicated piloting the orbiter might be. As you move downstairs, you will continue getting new views of the shuttle, and a series of interactive exhibits will educate visitors on what is involved with shuttle space travel and living in space aboard the ISS. While I didn't do it, there is also the shuttle launch experience, a simulator included with admission that is pretty self-explanatory from the name. After exiting the Atlantis building and heading back to the center of the complex, a number of exhibits still remain. Towards the back, a large building contains both a massive space-themed play area for younger children, as well as an IMAX theater playing educational but highly entertaining documentaries on NASA and space exploration. Nearby, you also have the chance to potentially meet and interact with an astronaut, with a variety of characters wearing suits that range from realistic to science fiction. Other buildings include the central gift shop and various eateries, as well as a small exhibit titled Journey to Mars, Explorers Wanted. Inside, this building contains a number of interactive and educational elements intended to excite visitors about the future of space travel to Mars. In the middle of this exhibit is an area with some benches where a show will occasionally take place throughout the day, trying to inspire a new generation of explorers to travel to this new and exciting frontier. The rest of this small building contains recreations of Mars rovers, which are actually much larger than I expected, having assumed that they were no larger than a medium-sized dog and not an actual rig the size of a car. Rounding everything out, a number of other small displays attempt to educate about the future of travel to the planet. This exhibit is small, but is still a nice part of visiting. Now though, I want to move on to the final major exhibit included with admission, which is the new experience known as Gateway, the Deep Space Launch Complex. Whereas most other exhibits have focused on NASA's history, this new building in front of the Rocket Garden is centered around the future of space travel from private enterprises. Inside, you'll find displays that feature products from companies such as Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and SpaceX, among others. Many of the displays also discuss both the future of space travel and space living. Working your way upstairs, there are also a series of flying theaters with different subjects, simulating flights from Mars to Earth-like planets many light years away. Also included with admission, I found this experience to be gimmicky and not particularly interesting, 
but something fun to do if there's no line. Otherwise though, I have to say that this new pavilion was rather uninspiring in regards to the future of space travel. The rocket suspended from the ceiling is a real SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket booster, but the various displays didn't have much educational value to them beyond interactive novelties. While I think there's a lot of potential for this building, it often feels like a lot of these exhibits are just taking up space for the sake of doing so. The Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex offers a lot more than what I've covered. While I thought it was important to highlight the experiences more broadly, there's still a lot of things that I miss doing, including many of the paid experiences, such as the extended bus tour, which allows you to get out in certain areas unavailable to normal visitors. Other paid experiences include meeting and speaking with actual astronauts, as well as a variety of simulators, ranging from driving a Mars rover to a VR experience that simulates trying to walk on the planet's surface. What really takes up your time at the various exhibits is their numerous interactive elements though, which would have been tedious to go through in a video like this, but you could easily spend a good few hours at the Apollo Complex or the Atlantis Building. There's a good variety of well-themed gift shops scattered throughout, and I do have to mention that the food eateries are pretty decent. What I also enjoy about the various exhibits and shows is that while NASA is obviously an American space agency, the tone of the complex is never nationalistic. It's very much focused on how NASA's space exploration created new opportunities for civilization that will lead all of humanity into the future, and not just Americans. While Florida of course draws in people from all around the world to its Orlando theme parks, I was also surprised by how strong the international draws at Kennedy Space Center was as well, encountering a large number of French, German, Japanese, and Russian tourists throughout my two days there. Overall, if you're interested in one of the most authentic educational museums I've ever been to, with some pretty entertaining exhibits and shows, along with impressive full-sized space vehicles and equipment, this is definitely a place worth traveling out of your way for if you're visiting Florida. There's a lot that I didn't discuss that could easily fill out a whole day, so if you ever find yourself fortunate to travel here, there's a lot more to discover. As always, if you want to help this video or the channel reach a wider audience, you can do me a favor and hit the like button. If you're interested in theme parks or themed experiences like this, you can also hit the subscribe button with bell notification so as to be alerted to new videos as they release.